Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the heartland of the Jesus Name Pentecostals, the Louisiana district of the United Pentecostal Church Tape Ministry. Tapes may be obtained by writing Tape Ministry, P.O. Box 248, Tioga, Louisiana, 71477. Let the tape roll. May you be blessed by this ministry to the glory of God. Shall we stand? Let me just say again how great it is to be here. I esteem your leadership in your district very highly, and it's a privilege to be in such a great fellowship that we're afforded such privilege to know people like we know and to rub shoulders with people that make you better and make you want to do more for God. Hasn't this been a wonderful camp meeting? Isn't it a wonderful time together? My dear friend, Brother Mooney, just rung the bell last night. It's just so great. I do believe the secret's in the sauce, don't you? If you weren't convinced of it last night, you need to get sauced up again. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Brother Tenney. Thank you, District Board. And thank you, wonderful saints of God, for your gracious uh, welcome in the comfortable room, the fruit basket, the bit of silence, and a bit of an opportunity to just reflect on the good things of God. Been a lot of people use that room over there. I just want to be the kind of man that God could use in this day, don't you? How many came today just wanting to do something good for the Lord? Amen. Did you come just looking forward to doing something for the Lord today? Worshiping Him, loving Him, praising Him. Why don't we just kind of put everything on hold here for a few minutes? I think I have about 48 minutes here to use and I need every moment of it, but I want us to just close our eyes and I want us to think of this wonderful song, Amazing Grace, shall ever be my song of praise. It was grace. How many of you remember that? He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. Would you lead out on that and let's worship the Lord. Amazing Amazing grace.
to this present day. Oh, mighty God. Oh, mighty God. You brought us from a long way. You've saved us, Lord. You have redeemed us. Oh, you've given to us this glorious truth. You've imparted to us, Lord, something that none other could do. Oh, God, I love you today. Oh, I love you today. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, let's tell him how we feel about him today. I love you, Jesus. I worship your mighty name, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for saving my children, Lord. Thank you for the call to the ministry, Lord. Thank you for my wife, Lord, that stood with me all these years. Thank you for a pastor that brought the gospel to our town. Thank you, Lord, for this glorious truth. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I shall forever give my praise to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Opening your Bibles with me this morning. But the tenny tells me I have an hour. Amen. How many of you believe the Lord can do something for us and with us in an hour? Amen. I think He can. In fact, He's doing a pretty good job of it right now. <laughs> Isn't it great? This isn't something you have to work up. It's something that's there already. Elder Barnett years ago used to tell us, he said, let me tell you, he said, we ought to all live in such a way that we would be so full and our vessel would be so full. When you see sometimes the glass that's been in the sink and the, the drip of the faucets just dripped and dripped until the glass is really full of, even above the brim. And just one little drop from that dripping faucet just overflows that vessel. And that vessel doesn't have a chance to get dirty at all. It gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. <laughs> and Brother Barnett said we ought to all live where just one little drop would do it. Just one little drop would do it. Hallelujah. So full of the Lord that we don't need just a whole lot of it to get us flowing over. Just one little drop will do it. Oh, don't you love him today? Hallelujah. Romans, the fifth chapter. Reading in your hearing today, the first five verses. And I pray that these verses will impact your life as they have all of us, I'm sure, at times past. But today, particularly, I'm asking the Lord. Therefore, being justified by faith, let's say faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Now, most of us would like to check out and ring the buzzer when we get to those things that are the real test of our discipleship. And verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Join hands with someone and Brother Tenney, would you come and pray and invoke something good on this lesson today? The word of the Lord is tried. May that which is tried be revealed to us today. Father, first anoint our ears, open our capacity. For we know your grace already rests upon the man of God and your anointing is his. May we receive the engrafted word that's able to deliver us. I take dominion over every spirit that would oppose the work of the Holy Ghost in this place. Now, in the name of Jesus. And you may be seated and for a while today I would simply like to teach on the simple subject that's already been queued up earlier in the service without them even knowing what my lesson was about today. It may sound old, it may sound rather, rather usual and rather, you know, ordinary, but I'm going to talk to you today about the amazing grace of God. Amazing. Let's say amazing. amazing. You can't even say that word without, without smiling. It just wraps around your face when you try to say it. Let's say amazing. amazing. Turn around there and look at somebody and say, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? <laughs> amazing. When you look into the mirror every day and you see what he's done for you, friend, 
If that isn't something amazing, I don't know what it would take to be amazing if you can look in the mirror and you can see what God's done for you without saying it's amazing. Amen. It's amazing. Let's say it together. It is amazing. <laughs> Brother Ronnie Gidrose, he is such a dear friend of our youngest son, Darren. And uh, when Darren came along rather unexpected in our later years in our life, well, uh, Ronnie would hold him at the camp meetings and fight the mosquitoes off of him and all. And, and uh, I thought many times as they looked at, the, at my wife and I, you know, advanced in years and yet starting a brand new family, you know. And headquarters even had the nerve to write a, a chapter, had my wife write a chapter in a book, and they designated the late last child. I wonder how they knew it was the last one, and I wonder why they gave me such restrictions here, you know. <laughs> but my wife needed grace. <laughs> She needed grace. Every day of that nine plus months, it was grace every day. It took grace to see her through. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. And that's just life situations. There's not any way we could prescribe what life is going to deal us. But, but I, I recall how that one time, you know, doing all these things when you're a little older and building tree houses again and going through all the, uh, the circumstances of the Berenstein Bears books and, and learning all the late time theology and uh, the bedtime stories and all of that. And we broke all the rules, you might say, you know, in this last one, you know, this late last child. And this isn't in my notes, but it just occurred to me that it takes grace to even endure things like that. It even it takes grace to endure our blessings sometimes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> and I remember one time my wife said, you need to build him something in the backyard or have someone build it. Build him a tree house or something to entertain him. And so I hired a carpenter and the carpenter came over and began to build a great big house out there in the neighborhood, began to look upon the scene. And a little boy up the street probably that will end up in MIT somewhere. He's a brain, you know, just walking around, you know. And, and, and you know, the child walks up there and sees the carpenter doing all these things and nailing boards together and, and doing all the things. And my boy is waiting patiently to see the craftsman finish his work so he can begin to play and so this child just looks at the scene and he says totally awesome <laughs> and I'm standing there and I'm listening to the sound of nails and I said what did you say and the child repeated it back again with folded arms and standing there as the inspector of the neighborhood he said totally awesome awesome. I was so tickled I went in the house and I told my wife I said do you know what this child said when he looked at that structure out there and she said what? And he said totally awesome and ever since then I began to think of all the things to me that are totally awesome I, I look at saints of God and one of you came to me not long ago in this meeting and said brother Grisham every time I think I'm about to despair said I think of that story you told us at the Bible conference about the lady that came into your church that showed up on the parking lot one morning with a pit bull and a big spaniel and she had on her, uh, her, her jogging suit and had a big M on her sweater and had straw in her hair and was carrying her shoes in her hand and the taxi driver was waiting on $12. And while I'm ready to start worshiping the Lord standing behind the pulpit, someone runs in there and says, uh, Linda needs uh, $12 for taxi fare. I said, what? And I said, somebody go on with the service. And I walked out in the, in the parking lot. And here's these dogs. This pit bull was uh, going this way on the leash. And the Spaniel was looking rather interested in the neighborhood. And I said, Linda, what in the world is going on? She said, well, Pastor, you told me that God looked on the heart. And said, I know I don't look like being at church today. She said, I've been out all night long. And I know that was wrong. And she said, I haven't been a good girl. And she went on. And you know, when she first came into the church and she repented a little bit and got baptized, you know. I, I, I'm telling you, she went wacky as a goose after she got baptized. See, the enemy began to really close in on her. And uh, she said, I just felt I needed to be here because you told me that God looked on the heart. I said, Linda, these dogs. She said, oh, Pastor, these are trained dogs, and we need someone to watch the parking lot anyway. And I said, Linda, your dogs may be trained, but those dogs on the other side of the fence are not trained. And I said, that pit bull on the other side of the chain link fence, or your pit bull, one or the other of them are coming over the fence, and we're fixing to have one of the biggest dog fights in the county. But did you know, now a little later, after she got the real Holy Ghost, she even laughs about that pit bull story. She comes in, she says, Pastor, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that, and you still love me. I sent two elders with her to take her home. I paid the $12. I wasn't going to trust one elder to go home with her and her two dogs. <laughs> but oh, I'm going to tell you what today, my friend. The love of God, the grace of God, it is totally awesome. Wow! 
<laughs> it is totally awesome. Turn to somebody there and say it is totally awesome. You see, the grace of God is the restorer of mankind to God. And you see, man was totally undeserving. Let's say totally undeserving. Romans the third chapter, the 23rd and the 24th verses says, For all have sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. You see, being justified freely by what? His grace. Through redemption, the Bible says, that is in Christ Jesus. He did it, friend. He did a great job. He worked it out. He, he made it possible that you and I could be redeemed and literally justified. I begin to look at these words that seem to be close kin folks. The word redemption simply means to, to release or to set free or to redeem back by paying a price. Then I looked carefully at the word justification and it simply means pronounced blameless as though it never happened. As though it never happened. And, and the amazing thing about it, Brother Tenney, the Lord doesn't even remember that pit bull deal here. <laughs> You know, it's amazing what God can do. And, uh, and this isn't a weakness message, friend. When you think of what God has done for you, friend, that's one of the strongest things you have going for you to think that God could do for you. Somebody looks at grace and they're scared of it and they look at some other subject. Don't be afraid of grace, friend. That's the thing it took to save you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And you look and see what a wretched mess you would be today were it not for the grace of Almighty God. I looked at these brown spots on my hand a while back, you know. And uh, my grandkids said, Papa, what's all them brown things on your hand? I said, honey, I don't have the slightest idea. I don't even, I can't explain it, but they keep coming. <laughs> they keep occurring. More of them. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've gone down to buy some Olay. They, they said you could Olay them away. I'm going to tell you, Olay won't do anything for them. If Olay would do anything, I rubbed almost until it was raw. <laughs> And Olay didn't do it. But you see, I have the feeling that on the day the Lord comes for the church, there's something going to be wrong with us even that day. We're not going to be perfect in the eyes of one another even that day. But I'm going to tell you what, my friend. Somehow through the ultraviolet rays of his blood, he looks at me and he doesn't even see blemishes the way that you might see them. He's a great God. He's an awesome God. He's a powerful God. Amazing. We look at Abraham and we just boast about him and we talk about, you know, staggered not in the promise of God. And then you look at the scripture and you think, well, God, where's your memory? Have you got Alzheimer's? And yet, you see, God is looking back at Abraham through the blood. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, my friend. The best thing we got going for us is the blood of Jesus Christ and the mercies of God that have been extended to us, not on the basis of our worthiness, but upon the basis of his powerful grace. Let's say grace. Let's say redemption. Let's say propitiation now. You see, propitiation, it's a close kin folk to justification and redemption. It means sacrifice, blood offering. You see, Jesus was our sinless, perfect sacrifice for every person. And then we look and see that sanctification or sanctified is close kin folks to these particular words as well. And this simply means we've been cleansed. Let's say cleansed. And then we've been, after we've been cleansed, we've been set apart. If you've ever washed any dishes, I'm going to tell you, you go and pre-wash them. <laughs> you do that yourself. You, you wash the, 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 the cabbage off of them. You scrape all the muck and the mess off of them. You, you, you just grind the cheese off of them. You, you scrape a little bit. Then after you've gotten all of it off that you can get off of it, you put it in the dishwasher and you put some cascade on there and you expect the cascade's going to loosen the rest of it. And the Bible tells us that we should cleanse ourselves as far as we can of all the works of the flesh and unrighteousness. And what you can't clean, my friend, he'll clean the rest of it. He's a good God. How many want to be set apart to do a great work for God? Oh, let's clap our hands to the Lord today. The problem with us sometimes is that we don't want to clean the part we can clean. We want him to have a portable washing machine to take around with us. Well, there's something about that we could talk about, but I'm speaking to you about the amazing Grace of God. And I begin to look recently at the various uh, thrusts of grace and mercy. In simplicity, as I related to you yesterday, grace is our teacher. Titus, the second chapter, the 11th through the 14th verse tells us, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live what? Soberly. Let's say soberly. That means we need to take this seriously. Hallelujah. If you're holding a grudge, you're dirtying up your life. If you're harboring a bitter spirit, you're dirtying up the stream of your life. You need to take this serious. You need to lay all that on Calvary and lay it aside and let the blood take care of it and get your act together and live soberly and righteously and godly. My, my, my. And when are we to do this? Sometime next week? No. Live godly right now in this present world looking for that blessed hope, hallelujah, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might, what, redeem us. There is that word again. Redeem us from what? All iniquity. Uh, deliver us and redeem us from the very factory that produces sin and purify unto himself a peculiar people, uh, hallelujah, and the Bible says that would be zealous of good works. Isn't it great, all the provisions that God has for us? I looked at that and I began to think of how that grace is an attitude on the part of God. Now, you know, it's amazing. You know, we, if, if the Lord asks us who to save sometimes, uh, we, we would uh, we'd tell him, no, no, not them. I, I think sometimes, you know, the, the Lord saves people that we would rather they just go ahead and go to hell sometimes. I pastor people sometimes that, that are just loyal and faithful and pay their tithes and, and would never miss a church. And, and through the years, I've had some of them just take a dislike to someone in the church. I mean, don't have anything against them, nothing to ask for forgiveness from or of. And they just simply, well, it's going to either be them or us. We're going to one or the other. It's going to have to leave this church because it's not big enough for both of us. I said, well, what's wrong? Have they ever done you any wrong? Well, not necessarily. It's just the way I feel about them. I don't like them. And I don't want my family around them. You know, well, you give me some documentation. Give me some reasons why they shouldn't be in this church. And you give me some reasons why you feel that way. Well, I can't explain it. I just simply do not feel like I want to be around here if they're going to be around here. Well, isn't that an immature situation to think that God would put them in the church and yet somebody would want to qualify them and say they don't belong here. If they belong here, I don't belong here. I'm going to tell you what, my friend. You need to go back to Calvary once in a while and lay our face on an altar and say, God, I wasn't worthy to get in this church and I don't have the right to judge anybody and while grace is an attitude on the part of God mercy is an action mercy is an action you see grace recognizes that mercy has no merit or that man has no merit grace recognizes that man has no merit of his own in receiving salvation from God it don't matter how goody goody you were friend grace has already got your number Grace knows that you didn't have any merit on your own to deserve salvation. I don't care if your family was raised in the church. I don't care if your mom and daddy never had a fuss. It was not their good deeds that made them worthy of salvation. It was the grace of God. And you look at your family tree long enough, there'll be somebody there hanging off that tree limb that you'll think needs mercy. When you begin to judge other people, my friend, you're going to find that down the road somewhere, somebody in your family is going to need heaps of mercy. And if you haven't been merciful, you're not going to have a thing in the world on your account. I counseled a couple one time that adultery is involved in their life. And my God, what a deal to have to deal with, you know. And... I went over to their home and the man was so mad and he was hurt and he was wounded. His best friend had taken advantage of his wife. And he'd go to the wall and he'd bust the wall with his fist. My God, why did this have to happen to me? And I sat there and I saw that vengeance and that anger. And I'm supposing that almost any man would be the same way. But I put my arms around him and I sat at that table with him. And I told him, I said, sir, here's the way it really is. It's bad. I have to admit it's bad. It's the worst thing that could happen to you. But she wants forgiveness. She's at the other end of the dining room table and she was weeping and crying. And I said, here's the way it stacks up. If you go ahead and divorce her and go your way, you'll still have to forgive her to be saved. Oh, well, that's some strange theology. Do her in, you know. She's no good. Stone her. Blast her. Bang her around. Kick her out. Put her in the street. Dress her up in the harlot's robe. Put her out there where she can finish her work. I'm going to tell you what, my friend. It don't matter what kind of sin it is or where it comes from or who caused it. We all are going to need the mercy and the grace of God. I said, wouldn't it be better to pick up the broken pieces of this life? You have a couple of children and they're going to be on pawns of bitterness as it were on a board of, of destruction. If you'll forgive her. Nobody needs to know this ever happened. If you love her, forgive her. 
Well, that might be easy to say and much harder to do. But I'm going to tell you today, my friend, when I go and preach at a certain church in a state uh, far off uh, and I see that couple there, it blesses my soul to see how God restored that marriage. And two years later, he said, Brother Grisham, I'll have to admit that much of that was my fault. I made my wife vulnerable. You see, that's what mercy begins to do. Mercy begins to look at it differently. Grace begins to move into action. God begins to work in the impossible way. It's the grace of God that brings men to repentance. Let's clap our hands under the Lord. Glory. Grace. Let's say grace. Let's say totally awesome. Let's say totally awesome. It's an attitude on the part of God. Mercy is an action. Grace recognizes that man has no merit of his own in receiving salvation from God. But mercy recognizes that man you know, has no responsibility to produce his own salvation. By human means. I've had people that have have resorted to psychology and so forth. And and, and believe me, I have nothing against these people. They can take it all apart. But I'm going to tell you, it takes somebody pretty pretty wise to put it back together. They can sort it all out and lay the pieces out there and mark all of them. But I'm going to tell you what, my friend, until there's some real desire on the part of the individuals involved to work it out. It's just another $70 an hour for the next six weeks when we could go to an altar and get blood applied to it and we wouldn't see it the same way and we'd have grace given to us and God would do His work. Grace. Totally awesome. Totally awesome. Let's say totally awesome. Titus the third chapter says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but what according, let's say according, In other words, this is the measuring stick. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and receiving of what? The Holy Ghost. How many of you could notice the change when God did something for you? I remember one of my good pastor friends a number of years ago won the town harlot to to the Lord. I mean, she's selling her body every week and the whole town knew about it. And she came to God, she got the real Holy Ghost. She got the real Holy Ghost. She cleaned up, she lined up, she shaped up in the mind of God. She was a brand new person. God never saw her as the town harlot anymore. And she began to teach Bible studies. And one of the most highly esteemed women in the church that was one time a harlot. Oh, God, help us to see that if God can clean up a harlot, if God can clean up a whoremonger, if God can bring a Greg McCool from the dance hall and bring him to the house of God, and that song he has written, I was that special unspoken request. Every time that little mama would raise her hand and say, my son needs God. Maybe after a while she grew a little bit weary and she thought the saints would grow weary, but I've got a special unspoken request. But here Greg sang on this platform today, he's that special unspoken request. If you a backslidden child don't give up on him don't throw him to the devil let the Lord work on him oh heal of a hoya totally awesome <laughs> the grace of God hallelujah hallelujah But judgment, it moves so slow. Judgment's just about like an old crippled man that's got arthritis. You take judgment, you know. It just moves so slow. You just kind of get the feeling it'll never get there. I remember one time Brother W.R. Starr preached a message that he talked about how that You know, when someone is done wrong and repeatedly done wrong, and they just, everybody knows that someday it's going to hit. Someday it's going to happen. And here comes judgment with the the summons in the hand, you know. Coming down the back alleys, you know, the London fog jacket up. Drizzling rain, fog, echo of footsteps on the wet streets. Coming down the back roads, coming to deliver the summons. And just about the time that judgment gets and looks up and well this is the address and turns this way in the distance up and down the street here's a pattern of running racing feet and mercy is running oh, oh. hey wait 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 and overtakes the judgment about the time he's stepping up on the porch he's been praying and judgment goes back very slowly again 
gets back and sits down on the seat of judgment again. Oh my God, if, if we all got what was coming to us, we'd be in the biggest mess today that you can imagine. But oh, His grace, His grace, His mercy has worked for us. Awesome. <laughs> Say it again. Totally awesome. Let's clap our hands under the Lord. Then I noticed something else that's amazing and so beautiful about this grace business. The 20th verse of the 5th chapter. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But, that little conjunctive term there. Let's say but. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. <laughs> and when it uses the word abound, Brother Ewing, maybe it's just my little boy mind. I got to, in my mind, this may be a little bit carnal, but I got to think of this song. Sailing, sailing over the bounding may. <laughs> and here comes a wave. <laughs> God's grace just rushes in and bathes you and washes you and cleans you and purges you inside and outside. His grace abounds. <laughs> Clap your hands up to the Lord. This isn't one of these little psychiatry couches I'm talking about. No, it's abounding grace. How many have ever come to the house of God with a bitter spirit, an angry, critical spirit about you, and you got into the presence of God and and you went away with a forgiving spirit? I'll tell you what it was. It was the grace of God. Let's clap our hands under the Lord again. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the prophet began to think this over. In Lamentation, the third chapter, the 21st to the 23rd verses. He said, this I recall. Let's all scratch our head a little bit. You're already done there, brothers. He said, this I recall to my mind. How many know that we need to recall some things to our mind once in a while? Brother Barnes, that would fix most everything. If we'd recall the right things to our mind. He said, this I recall. To my mind, therefore I have hope. When you begin to despair and you feel like you've done it in and you're all finished, then scratch your head a little bit and recall some things to your mind. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's clap our hands and say, Great. Let's sing that old song. Great is thy faithfulness. Sing it with me. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. New mercy I see. I'm calling to mind. All I have needed. Thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. How many have had your mercies renewed this morning already? How many got on your knees today? You didn't have much time to sin when we got in bed last night. You went home with a tired body, sweaty body, got a good shower, got up this morning, brand new day, but it didn't matter that we sinned. It just something, we just went to him and just said, no Lord, just in case. How many prayed a lot of just in case situations? Oh, hallelujah. Mercy is renewed what? Every morning. Let's say mercy is renewed. Every morning. This is a powerful message that you can, can win souls with. Let's say mercy. How many received mercy? How many received a lot of it? All right. And then let's move into another dimension. Man, this is powerful. Let's say powerful. Glory. Hallelujah. It says that faith overcomes while grace abounds. Get 
a picture of a gigantic wave just knocking everything out of the way to keep you from failing and washing you in the process. And then the Bible says, faith overcomes, 1 John 5 and 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Let's say our faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We have a great God. And we can be an overcomer through faith in Him. Let's say grace abounds. Let's say faith overcomes. And yet the Bible says love covers. Grace abounds. Faith overcomes. And love covers. First Peter 4 and 8. And above all things have fervent. That means red hot love. Lukewarm love doesn't know how to cover anything. Now this isn't a scripture to rationalize sin. But I'm going to tell you what my friend. If it was your child. That you were wanting mercy for. If it was your wife you were wanting mercy for, your husband you are wanting mercy for, I'm going to tell you what, my friend, you do everything in your power to stretch the love of God, to exercise the love of God, to believe in the love of God, because it's something you're depending on. The Bible teaches us that love doesn't fail. It'll be around when you wrap it all up and hit the ad button to the end of the age. It's going to be around. And love has the ability to cover multitudes of sins. In other words, many of them, God's love. How many sins has He covered for you? How many times has He forgiven you? Let's clap our hands under the Lord and say, You did it, Lord. And to me, it's still totally, totally awesome. And then in this lamentation, the third chapter, it mentions something about hope. Now remember, grace abounds. Do it again with me. Don't spit on your neighbor. Let's do it together. Grace abounds. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many still depend on the grace of God to abound in your respect? And then faith overcomes. And love covers. And then hope has the unique ability to recall and renew. Let me read that to you again from Lamentation chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. This I recall in my mind. Therefore have I hope. Let's say I have hope today. And it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I still have some hope, Lord. But some things you need to remember. Grace is universal and unconditional. It's everywhere. If you were in an airplane 35, 50,000 feet above the ground, grace would be there. You don't have to land to get grace. You can say, well, when we land, there'll be some grace here for us. <laughs> and grace, if you were in a submarine way off the coastline here and you were down on the bottom of the ocean... Somehow or another, God's grace can go deeper than sonar. <laughs> and God's grace can go higher than the radar. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God can get behind doors where there's no hope for anybody there. And He can abound in that situation. Hope renews. How many renewed it today? You recall some things. I scratched my head early this morning. Lord, I said, I've got hope. <laughs> it isn't over with yet. I've got hope. And grace came abounding. And my faith was built up a little bit. Hallelujah. Glory. Whispering hope. <laughs> hope doesn't sound like ocean waves sometimes. It's just the silence of knowing what has happened in the past and what can happen in the morning. And basically the Lord says when you get these things all together and you make your little outline, you need to do this real often because you see, this hope is what's going to keep you around and be ready for the coming of the Lord. There will be a day that all this will wrap up like a scroll. Clap your hands again unto the Lord. Grace is universal. And grace is un unconditional. You can't earn it. You can't say, well, I've got six coupons here. I've saved up and I just it'd get me about a half order of grace here. No, no. You don't clip out coupons. You don't build up seniority. It don't matter how long your family's been in the church. You don't have a grace coupon book that you say, I'm worthy now. 
Don't tell me this is expired. I've been saving these coupons for six years. I paid double tires three times. <laughs> Hoggy washy. Lord said, take your coupons and go down where you can buy something. You're not buying this for me. This is not for sale. I'm going to use it however I choose and give it to whoever I plan on. Do, and you're not going to change it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, mercy, here's a little difference. Mercy is obtained by volitional pursuit. God isn't in the domino pizza business. He doesn't guarantee 20, 30 minute delivery if he doesn't run any stop lines, you know. But you see, if you want mercy, you have to go and get on your little horse or get on your Honda or go to an altar. You've got to say, God, I'm coming after it. When people won't even come to an altar and pray, Brother Barnes, and when people claim they want their healing, they won't even come to church. And when people claim that they want to have the blessings of God on their family, and yet they hold grudges against somebody else's family, if you want mercy, you've got to go and show up and obtain it by volition. You make a determination. I'm going to get mercy. And when we go to get mercy, we have to admit that we have a need of mercy. And we have to repent of our ill deeds. We have to repent of our indifferent spirit. We occasionally have to ask somebody to forgive us. And we've got to learn to keep our trap shut more often. If we want mercy, we've got to do something by our own volition to prove that we want Him. Clap your hands under the Lord and say, I want mercy. I've got to have mercy, Brother Sam. i got to have it. And I renewed it this morning. I just checked it out. Still there. <laughs> you know why it's still there? The Bible teaches us that blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If somebody's ever done you wrong, friend, the best way to do it upright, put the monkey on their back, roll it up, tie it together, wrap it up, and lay it before God and say, it's finished there. It's all there. Uh, it's all packaged up here. I'm forgiving Quiet in here right now. Getting quiet in here right now. But you look in the mirror again and see what God has done for you. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to come away saying, He's totally awesome. Hallelujah. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 16th verse says, Therefore, let us come therefore boldly. This doesn't mean flippantly, it means confidently to the throne of grace. And as I mentioned briefly to you yesterday in passing, and I used Darren, our 15-year-old son, as an example here. You know, grace is a great teacher, and it mentions this in the setting of a throne position. The throne of grace. That's lofty terms. In other words, you can't get any higher than this. The throne of grace. How many of you are thankful that we know who, who is on that throne? And we come boldly to the throne of grace. And the scripture says we do this that we may obtain. Let's say obtain. Reach out and, and get a hold of something. And just say, this is, I'm taking it home with me. I'm obtaining it. I've come before you and I'm going to obtain mercy and find what? Grace. When I leave the throne here, I'm going to have the grace to keep myself straight from this point on, okay? And if I fail again, I'll come back again to the throne. My surveys and teaching of family seminars, I found that probably more than 90% of the people fuss on their way to church. They fuss, they fuss. Oh, if you did fix your hair last night. You know good well, the church didn't just happen as a surprise today. We knew church was going to be today. Three days ago, I keep figuring out why you didn't get those kids washed. Can you figure out why you didn't fix your hair at least half of it last night? It don't look any better now than it looked yesterday, but you say it's fixed. Well, shut your mouth. And then we pull up on the church parking lot. Well, praise the Lord. How are you folks today? <laughs> praise the Lord. But could God bless you. Hallelujah. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise you, Jesus. And your mate or your kids are over there peeking at you out of the corner of their eye. And there have been times I've had to go to my wife and say, Honey, while nobody was looking, I thought, you know, and I said, Look, honey, I'm sorry I kind of got a little bent out of shape today. <laughs> and, friend, she could bind my anointing that day. That little old gal, you know, those black eyes, she could look at me, she could tie me in knots. 
You say, isn't there enough of God to get through that? Oh, no, friend. There was no aisle running, no bench jumping, no thing that you can do to get free from that binding force. And somehow or another, you quit kicking shins for a few days and have a little more love in the home. And a lot of this hellfire preaching sometimes is nothing more than a, a sign of, of problems in the home. When there's a lot of love at home, friend, oh, the services go beautiful. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and it shall forevermore endure because there's love at home. You don't get any sugar at home and man, it's hell for the next few days. There's going to be a burning hell. Let's say the grace of God. Let's say brains all the way through. And in spite of us blowing the deal real often, God still loves us. God still is patient with us. God still gives us mercy. Let's clap our hands under the Lord. Matthew 5 and 7. Now you straighten up, I'll make you write your name on the blackboard. <laughs> what this teaching business does it just digs things up tears up the flower bed it rearranges everything and we get back and say God I'm a bigger mess than I thought I was <laughs> come on now church let's do good for Jesus let's give mercy <laughs> Have you ever pulled up to a bank window and you sat there a long time? What in the world? I'm changing my banking place. And somebody's sitting there with four little kids in the back seat. They're screaming and crying. You can see old pop cans all in the back of the window and pamper boxes here and there. And they're fussing. Well, we made a deposit over the weekend. I don't know what's going on here. There's nothing here. And they're embarrassed. Well, I'm going to change my banking place. And the fact is, there's a confusion about the deposit. But I'm going to tell you what in God's economy the Bible said if you want to get some out and you want to have something to draw on blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. You can fill out the little slip and the Lord said here it is. You can have mercy because you have been merciful. Let's say glory to God. Glory Romans 11 chapter the 30th verse 4 as ye in times past have not believed God yet have now obtained mercy let's say it again obtained how many of you remember the, the day or the night that you got mercy oh friend oh friend man you were you were the cock of the walk for a few days I'm a deal now my record's clear the account's been settled hallelujah <laughs> it just changed your entire perspective to think that God didn't hold anything against you Let's say, I obtain mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even so have these also now believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. This grace message and this Acts 238 message applied in the right way. We can look at anybody from through jail bars or in divorce courts or in delinquency uh, arbitration situations and we say, hey, there's hope here. There's hope here. All we need to do is get our act together and get some mercy from God, get His blood covering these sins and get our act together and you, you can see a different citizen here. I can give you the record of what Paul said. He says, you know, 1 Timothy 1 and 13, Paul made this statement. Who was before, speaking of himself, a blasphemer. Let's say blasphemer. Man, that's pretty bad company. And a persecutor. Let's say persecutor. And beyond that, he said, I was even injurious. But... Let's say, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Again, James the second chapter and the 13th verse. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. If you want God to throw the book at everybody but you, you have real problems. I'm, I'm depending on his mercy. I'm planning on staying straight and living right, but I just guarantee you that if, if things go like they look like they've gone in the past 62 years, I'd probably lose my temper somewhere. Now, you never thought a little sweet fellow like me would ever lose his temper, did you? Indians wait a long time to get mad, but when they do, they don't get over it quick. I've been around people that blow their cool, hurt your feelings. 
ream you out good and then they want to hug your neck and kiss you the next day, you know, like, like nothing ever happened. I don't work that way. I'm going to work about six or eight months to keep them getting mad, but once I get mad, don't come around hugging my neck for a few days. Let me just simply think this thing over a little bit. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, my friend. God's mercy comes quick. It's like a bolt of lightning. Just that quick salvation can reach you. Just that quick mercy can come. But judgment walks slow. Oh, hallelujah. Boy, I feel good right now. I feel 12 minutes of anointing here. <laughs> Praise God. Let's clap our hands under the Lord. Hallelujah. Now notice here, the scripture, the language of scripture says, whosoever will. Let's say it together. Whosoever will. That, that sounds like mercy. I noticed in the Old Testament scriptures, oftentimes they had a common well and, uh, you know, some people, well, I'm going to take my sheep down there. Get your mange. They said, some of your sheep got mucus in their eyes. My God, I'm not going down. I'm going to wait till they leave. I'm not going to show up. Well, honey, when you get there, the well will be capped. Because they waited till they all got there and opened the cap of the well. And they said, you bring your little sheep over here, let them all drink. Mangy eyes, mucus running out of their ears. Tail chewed off by a wolf. Old leg that's been dragged around for the last three weeks waiting for the gangrene to finally eat the last quarter inch. And yet all those sheep got to get over there and get a drink. And somebody that thinks they're just too hot shot to drink at the well. The Bible says, whosoever will. Mangy mouth, dirty life, whoremongers, backsliders, anybody. The Bible says, you bring them all here. We're taking the cap off the well. They're going to get to drink of the water of life. And they can sip and sip and drink and slop and slurp until they get satisfied. And when we begin to pre-qualify, who's going to drink? You mark it down, the cap will be on the well when we get thirsty. Glory. Come to the instrument. So his brother Mooney says, I'll get the signal that I'm supposed to land. I'm getting signal from the tower now. Mercy has several thrusts. One deals with responsibility. One deals with relief. Let's say responsibility. Your responsibility is to go ask. God's promise is already out there. He's going to He's going to forgive. Years ago, Sister Mary Williams told Brother Lauren Hedger something that I'll never forget. He was a converted Catholic and he'd get on the radio and boy, he wanted to just lay everybody out. You know, he's a good man, great preacher. Oh, he loved this truth. Sister Mary Williams told him, Brother Barnes, I'll never forget. She said, Brother Hedger, if you ever love souls as much as you love truth, you're going to be some kind of preacher. If you love truth, you want everybody to get a drink of this. The up and out, the down and out, the indifferent, the backslider, the harlot. Brother Young, I want everybody to get a drink of this, don't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, don't you love the Lord today? Don't you love the Lord today? But if you want relief, your responsibility is to come and obtain mercy. You see, the judge can render the penalty that the law prescribes if one is found guilty of those offenses. But if certain stipulations can be met, the judge has the privilege and the prerogative, if he chooses to do so, to let you go free. I remember one time Brother Barnes going to the camp meeting down there near Marshall, Michigan, and I was just driving, trying to get there. Man, I'd driven from Detroit, and, man, trying to get there, and I come to this little stop sign. And there's nobody there. It's a dark country road. I didn't completely stop. Why stop? I'm in a hurry. It's God's business. And I hadn't gotten but about a quarter mile around the corner. Woo! Shine that light right in my rear view mirror. I pulled over. Oh, no. He swaggered up there side of that car, you know. He said a bad word. He said, you didn't stop worth a you. You know what? I said, oh, I know it, sir. Said, Did you know those stop signs are there for your safety? Oh, I know it, sir. And you know for the next five minutes you would have been so proud of me. 
I told him what a good officer he was. I said, you know, you probably saved my life because you taught me something tonight. I'm on the way to church, but you taught... Oh, I'm so glad that we have officers of the law that are out here patrolling these highways that are looking after us this way. You've done a great job, and I, I want to tell you how thankful I am. But I'm telling you, it didn't matter how good my presentation was. He got that little pad out, and he began to write some things down there. And he handed it to me. He said, Just remember when you come by the stop sign again. I took that on to church, and man, my blessings were kind of squinched that night. Hallelujah. But you see, Jesus took our place. The charges are dropped. Remember this today. Faith reaches out and embraces God. Do it like this. Faith reaches out and embraces God. We can come boldly to the throne and get something from Him. And hope reaches out to embrace mercy. Boy, when you get mercy, there's hope. And love reaches out to embrace the peace of God, which passes all understanding isn't it amazing hallelujah let's say it's amazing if you lose your hope you see you've lost the anchor to your soul years ago when I was in the business world and all my ambitions were just to make enough money to help the missionaries so we didn't have to travel begging for money and all and I started these companies and I got me some partners that had some sense you know more education than I did and I, I made a serious mistake of going into business with those that were not in the truth. See, they'll love you as long as you're paying their paycheck, but when the going gets a little rough, they'll steal everything from the calculator. They'll come down there at night and steal you blind. And I had a maze of problems I couldn't seem to ever solve. And my wife would have to pray me out of bed someday. The print of my body would be there. And I was a preacher, associate pastor of the church, same time. These five companies over here and go in and keep a few hours and make these payrolls and go over here and go and do all these things and I was oh I come to Christmas one year that I'd have to get out some days and I'd have to say oh my God am I going to raise $30,000 today before 5 o'clock my God I'd go out there and I'd just ask people to pay me for what I'd done for them I'd run home and put on the Happy Goodman record and I wasn't altogether a Happy Goodman fan but man I'm going to tell you that song the answer is on the way this I know Man, I'd put it on. I'd run in the house and my wife had to pray me out of that bed to print in my body. My pajamas would be so wet I had to get up and change two times a night. Go to church and weep my way to victory. Gonna tell you God's good. I remember going this day to a lawyer's office before the Christmas holidays. He was a good friend of mine. He's an Olympic champion wrestler. and Went to school with him and I said, Bill, I need your help. I had this file and all this terrible stuff in it. I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? He took that file and he laid it on the corner of his desk and he said, now Charlie, he said, you brought me this file today and he said, everything in here, I've got it. You go today and over the weekend and over the holidays, you have a good time. You go somewhere with your family and enjoy yourself. Okay? And you remember, you've left it in my hands. I'm making a point here. And did you know, Brother Sism, I got down on the street down, waiting on the light to change. And I'm like a fluttering little child. I felt like crying. But I looked up there at the second or third story window of that lawyer's office. And I thought, all my problems were up there on his desk. Brother Ewing, you know what? I'm so happy. I went home. Come on, honey, we're going to have a nice Christmas. We won't have many gifts this year. We're not going to get to do many things. But we got, we got peace. And, and we got happiness. We have each other. We have the Lord. And I promise you, what I laid up there on his desk, Brother Coon, he hadn't even opened that folder all through the weekend, I'm sure. All through the Christmas holidays. But somehow, I left it up there. Come on. You take it to Jesus. He has the power and the authority to take care of it. As they play softly, I'm going to conclude with this simple little story that's a true story. There's a, a man that taught in seminary and it was told of him that he was a very dry, boring teacher because his subject was archaeology. And how can you get excited about bases and artifacts and things of that nature? But the student, one of them who happens to be 
the speaker for the Seventh-day Adventist movement and named Joe Cruz. I heard him tell this story. He said, you know, there was one exception. He said he could talk about artifacts and he'd talk about his Holy Land tours. And it didn't seem to be all that inspiring. But when he talked about Jesus, he said it was different. For it seemed that he must have had an intimate relationship with Jesus. How many know that makes a difference? And he said he would go every year to his little excursions and expeditions to dig in the soil there to find things to bring back. And he said, students, this year when I was there in the Holy Land, he said, I, I went to a pottery shop. He said, I wanted to bring something back to give to all of you. And he said, when I went there, there was nothing in that entire pottery shop that appealed to me. I didn't have an interest in any of it. He said, but there was one vase back on the top shelf in the entire back there rather obscure from the rest of the display he said I told the potter he said would you mind getting that one vase down for me that's back there on the shelf and the potter stood and said which vase he said that one there he said why that one he said well sir that's the only one in this entire shop that interests me he reluctantly got it down and set it on the, the counter there and he said how much do you want for this? He said, this is the only one here that isn't for sale. He said, all of the other ones are for sale, but this one isn't for sale. He said, but why? That's the only one I want. He said, well, let me tell you about that piece of pottery. He said, that was the most unmanageable, unworkable piece of clay that I have ever held in my hands in all my life. He said, there were so many imperfections and the gravels and the and the slivers that were in that piece of clay, it was so unmanageable. I used waters and solvents and oils. Nothing would break down the imperfections of that unmanageable piece of clay. And he said, in utter frustration, I just threw it over in the back of the, the shop and it lay there in the corner for days. He said, then one day as I was passing back through the shop to do some more work on the wheel, he said, I looked at that piece of clay. And he said, I picked it up again. And I took it. That unmanageable, that imperfect, that unworkable piece of clay. And I put it back again on the wheel. And I began to pour the oils and the solvents and the waters. And I began to, to work it and got my hands in it again. And he said, one of those imperfections or one of those slivers struck my hand and sliced it across my hand. And he said, all of those fuchsias and purples and pinks are my blood. He said, there must have been something in the properties of my blood that could break down the imperfections of that unmanageable, unworkable piece of clay. I can't sell it. And he said, of course, the class knew where he was coming from. Jesus, the master potter, the great potter that sees hunks of clay like that all through the world. And while others have rejected them and no one felt that something could be done to change the circumstance, one more time, the great potter begins to work it and puts it in his hands again. And he's bought us with precious blood. Oh, to me, this is amazing. Would you stand? Sing with me there. Amazing grace will always be my song of praise. praise. 